good morning children so in previous classes uh, we have studied about how this uh, delhi sultanate started starting with muhammad go uh, no, gajini later mahmud of gori later slave dynasty and all other dynasties how they ruled uh, later you have studied uh, uh, you know till tughlaq dynasty uh, sayed lodi so all such dynasties you have studied and finally also studied that the great delhi sultanate has declined and it went into the hands of moguls so before entering into other part of the medieval indian history let us study about uh, the life under delhi sultanate so we have not no learned till now much about what was their administrative style how the society was there how people have organized themselves and you know what is their architecture all such kind of details so all such things we will study in this chapter life under delhi sultanate so let us proceed with the chapter so spanning over 3 centuries from 1206 ce to 1526 ce so almost 3 centuries that means 300 years this delhi sultanate has uh, this delhi sultanate was at its uh, glory okay and this delhi sultanate marked a watershed in the history of the indian subcontinent what do you mean by watershed here watershed means it's like a turning point to indian history so earlier to that you know we we have uh, learned about some civilizations later and other uh, you know dynasties rajput kings and all but here after the entry of uh, muhammad of ghori ghajni and you now later these dynasties it has taken altogether a different turn in the history so that is meaning of watershed in the history of indian subcontinent so the entry of muslims into india and their rule began with only this delhi sultanate delhi as headquarters different rulers of islamic origin they have entered india and they were they started ruling india and how many years of time they have i mean what was the span of time they ruled almost 300 years so the vast and expansive rule transformed india's political economic social and cultural history so this 300 period 300 years of time it just uh, not only you know we just we discussed about their uh, sultans their uh, expeditions and you know their achievements right but it is not only that there was other side of impact of this delhi sultanate so keeping delhi as headquarters the sultans of delhi of different dynasties they have also brought a different kind of impact on indian history they took a different turn in indian history also what is that different turn that happened in indian history islamic rule started in indian history that's a different turn and it also created an impact on indian history in which areas of indian history or on indians it created impact it created impact on political aspects that means how uh, new kind of administration new political masters for india came here and economically it also created an impact and the society got a big impact okay so politically economically means financially socially means in society and cultural history so culture means starting from uh, if you take uh, the language you take uh, the other kind of aspects everything so culturally there was a change politically there was an impact economically socially so in all such areas there was huge impact of this delhi sultans the amalgamation of the islamic turkish and afghan traditions with the native indian culture greatly influenced indian society so what happened exactly uh, we are saying that uh, it created an impact in different sectors how it created an impact see a different set of religion islam okay from turkey afghanistan people from see you take uh, uh, this man mohammad of gori ghajni and you take babar who came at the end or you take many rulers they are in the arabic world they are from 
different parts like Turkey, Afghanistan, okay, <coughs> and the culture is Islamic culture there also. So the Islamic culture from Turkey, Afghanistan, they entered India. They mixed with already existing Indian culture. Already in India, there was Hinduism. There was uh, you know many other religions which were existing those days. There was a different set of culture, Vedic culture. You take you know, different kind of culture was already existing in India, and this Islamic culture from Turkey, Afghanistan, it came and it amalgamated. Amalgamated means it got mixed up with our own culture here and influenced our society. That means thus it has made it has become as a part of our culture in India. Moreover, contact with the Arab world was kept alive by Muslim traders who brought their culture and religion to the subcontinent. So initially, the Muslim traders who visited India, later, they, I mean, they made, uh, they passed down information to this Mahmud of Ghazni, Ghori, and later the slave dynasty and all. I don't want to go into that again. So these traders who are very important people, in bringing this culture to India, see, once these traders came to India and they settled here or they were going and coming, whatever is the case, they always kept in contact with the Arab world. You take any dynasty, slave dynasty, the ministers were will be from Persia or Turkey or Afghanistan. So that is, these people, even though they settled in India as rulers, their ministers and all were from Turkey, Afghanistan and other Arabic world countries. That is, they always kept contacts with their native places. Even though these Islamic rulers or Islamic traders, they came and settled in India, they got mixed up with the Indian culture here, still they had contacts with their own people in their Arabic world. That means, for example, a person A has come to India. Okay. He has settled India. He has settled in India. He belongs to some country X. Okay. Consider some country X. So this A belongs to X. A has come to India and he has settled here. But he is an Islamic person. But even though he settled here, he regularly used to go to this his native country X and come back. So what happens? The cultural exchange was very much continuous. They never forget their culture in uh, country X and they didn't completely become a culture of Indians. So they got mixed up and they never forget their own native culture. So that was an, a very imp big impact of, uh, you know, this uh, Delhi uh, Sultanate. or uh, It was the called amalgamation of both Arabic and Indian culture. So that's an interesting wave of fusion between two cultures known as Indo-Islamic culture arised in India. So, this Islamic people who came from Arabic world, they came to India, they, they have got mixed up with our culture here and it created a new culture. One is Islamic culture, another is Indian culture. This two culture got mixed up now because these Islamic traders, rulers, they uh, they became part of Indian subcontinent. So when they became part of Indian subcontinent and these two cultures came into contact with one each other, it created a fusion of culture. That means both cultures exchanged best part of their own things. So there was a fusion of culture and that culture was called Indo-Islamic culture. You may get doubt what is exactly culture. So culture, you take any culture, it's, it's a combination of language, it's a combination of architecture, it's a combination of, uh, you know, many other things. You take their uh, construction of forts, you take the languages they speak, new languages have come. So like this, you know, in many areas, culture starts with such a certain primary thing. You take administration, okay. So these all are part of culture. So here, this culture became fused. That means it was called as Indian and Islamic culture or otherwise it is called Indo-Islamic culture. 
and administration of Delhi Sultanate. So Delhi as headquarters, many de sultans have ruled. How they have ruled? That is called administration. The administrative machinery. Here machinery means not machines, okay? People. The administrative machinery of the Delhi Sultans was inspired by the Abbasids. So the Delhi Sultans who ruled Indian subcontinent, they had they followed a kind of administration which for which was followed by Abbasids. Who are these Abbasids? So Abbasid dynasty was uh, uh, the dynasty after these Khalifas. This was a dynasty, you know, which was ruling Islamic world. So they got inspired with the administrative style. That means with the working style of Abbasid dynasty, and they implemented same kind of administration even in India. It was theocratic in character. What do you mean by theocracy? Theocratic or theocracy? Theocratic means a government ruled by with some divine uh, people. That means the sultans, they rule the people based on the religious text, Islamic text, Quran. So based on the uh, rules and regulations of Quran, a king consider himself as almost uh, you know derived powers from god and he rules that kind of go uh, ruling was called theocracy or theocratic in character a very divine character see islamic rule was based on their religion their religious scriptures okay and the sultan consider himself as a uh, what do you call he is a, he is a descendant of god and he got uh, powers from god and with that powers, he uses religious text called Quran and other things, and he rules people based on that. That kind of ruling was called theocratic rule. And the Delhi Sultanate was an Islamic state. That means, as they rule based on their religious scriptures and all, it was called Islamic state. And the head of the state was regarded as the religious leader of the people. The Sultan was also regarded as religious leader to their religion the sultan acts as i mean head as well as he consider himself as the ruler of the entire place he is not only the king or ruler but he is also the religious head of that particular uh, people there and it was believed that he derived his authority from god so the king, the sultans also believed that how they were eligible as sultans means they got the power from the god and through that power they are ruling the people and they consider themselves as a very divine, very holy people. So that was the kind of administration they followed and they learnt it from Abbasids. So if you look at the administration of the Delhi Sultanates, the head of the uh, you know Sultanate was Sultan. He is head of the state as well as administration. All powers will be with him. He is the supreme power. Executive powers means giving orders and all such powers. Judiciary powers means passing judgments. Military means controlling all the uh, military. All powers are vested with the Sultan. And so that's why the Sultan was the supreme uh, person in the uh, this kind of uh, Delhi Sultanate. He was assisted by nobles and ulemas so this sultan was having some help okay he was assisted by nobles that means some ministers and also ulemas ulemas means they are the religious heads okay like they are very much uh, having knowledge in their religious scripts like quran and other things and they used to continuously guide the sultan in terms of religious aspects and other such things so on one hand to rule all the executive, judiciary and military affairs, the Sultan used to take help of some ministers. Also, the Sultan depends on ulemas. Ulemas are the religious people who are having a very good knowledge in the sacred text of Islam. And the language of administration was Persian. A Persian was an official language used by these people during Indian administration. And the ministers were wazir. 
So I'll just read out the names and what department they were ruling. Wazir, he was the Prime Minister and Head of Finance Ministry. So Prime Minister under Sultan, he was, there will be lot of ministers, right? For all these ministers, there is one head. He was called Wazir. And Sultan will directly ask any details to Wazir. And Wazir will head all the other small group of ministers. Wazir is also the controller of finance department, all taxes and all. He will control. And Arizi Mamalik, he is the defense minister. Dabir E. Mamalik, he is the minister of maintain records of the royal court. So how much taxes are coming or you take uh, many details of the king and all such information. Maintenance of all those records, financial uh, things and all such things. You know, who are the kings, their uh, family members, all such information he used to document and keep. And Chief Sadr or Chief Kazi, Head of Department of Justice. So, passing judgments, giving punishments and all. This minister used to look after. Chief Kazi or Chief Sadr. <coughs> A Sultan himself cannot uh, uh, take all the day, you know, he cannot uh, completely involve. He takes help of these ministers in administration. And his decision is final. Sultan's decision would be final if any doubt comes with the uh, different kinds of ministries. And provincial government. So Sultan rules from Delhi and that is called central government. And under this central government, there are many states, right? Like in today, we India have uh, Delhi as uh, our capital city and where central government will be there. And we all have state governments, right? Like Andhra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu. These are states. In those days also, from Delhi, there, is a cent there was a central government and there were many kingdoms under Delhi government. So, each kingdom was considered as a state and each state had a own government. So, that was called provincial government. Kingdom was divided into provinces called Iktas. So, the, Delhi, uh, the kingdom, the entire kingdom was divided into Iktas. Okay, and Iktas was headed by Iktadars. So, Ikta was a word that they we are using a word called state. In those days, they have used a word called Iktas. And today we are first state, we have a head called chief minister. In those days, Iktas were governed by Iktadars. And Iktas were again divided into Shiks. Okay, and the Shik was headed by Shikdar. So, modern day, if you take state, as Ikta and this uh, uh, Ikta was divided into Shiks again. So state is again divided into districts, right? So you can consider this Shik as a district. So each Shik was headed by Shikdar and Shiks were further divided into Paraganas. Like districts you can take as further divided into some local towns and villages you can consider. So Iktas, Iktas were further divided into Shiks and Shik was further divided into Paraganas. So this was the kind of administration that this Delhi Sultans followed. Ikt was headed by Iktadar, Shik was headed by Shikdar and Paraganas were divided by, sorry Paraganas were ruled and this Paraganas were having a village headman called Mukaddham. Okay. So, thus the provincial government was divided under Delhi Sultans. So, what was the social structure? How society was divided in Delhi Sultanate, under Delhi Sultanate? The society under Delhi Sultanate was divided along caste and class lines. So, what do you mean by caste? So, you know that by this time in India, the, from Vedic society itself, those people were divided based on castes, right? In Hinduism, there were many various castes and that was one kind of division in society and other division was class lines. What are these class lines? If you look at the picture here, these are the classes of people living here. Okay, aristocracy means the rulers, priests means the religious uh, persons and the common town people and the farmers. So, based like this, people were divided along with castes. If you take, because here 
if you want to discuss under Delhi Sultanate, there were two groups of people living. One were Hindus and other small minor religions and other was Islamic people. So Hindus were divided based on caste. So they said society was divided based on caste lines and Islamic people in their administration, they have made a different classes like aristocracy, priestly class, town people and peasantry. So they consider that the society was also divided based on class lines. The caste system was rigid and strictly followed. That means castes were, caste system was very much, uh, uh, you know, flourishing in those days. People were very strict, uh, to, they were sticking to their own caste. And you know the Hindu society those days, there was division of higher caste and lower caste. And the higher caste used to treat the lower caste very uh, low. And uh, they never uh, had marriages between inter, I mean, caste, in between caste. Inter-caste marriages were not there. They used to follow several kind of untouchability and other practices. Many things were there in those days. That is the meaning of rigid and strict. So, many Hindus, particularly those in the lower rung of the society, lower rung means, rung means generally if you take ladder, okay, there will be horizontal sticks like this, isn't it? So, if you, this was the kind of, this is called rung. To place our foot, you know, we use this uh, horizontal thing. It is called rung. So, in society of those days, if you take this is one uh, division of people. This is caste division and this is class division. And the lower rung of the people, that means in Hinduism, if you take this is the division of caste. This is one caste. This is another caste. Suppose this is another caste. This is another, some ex caste. Those days, if you take Hinduism, there was Brahm, uh, there was kings at the highest level, or Brahmans, uh, Brahmans at the highest level. Then come Kshatriyas, then comes Vaishyas, then comes Shudras. So they are placed at different levels. Now the lowest rung, that means you take Shudras. In those days, many Hindus, particularly those in the lower rung, that means is Sudra caste. They were attracted to the tenets of Islam and converted to Islam. These lower caste people were treated very much badly by these higher caste people in Hinduism those days. They were not allowed to enter into temples. They were not allowed for education. They were not having a proper treatment. So these lower caste people, they were having a lot of problems with higher caste. So they slowly left Hinduism and they got attracted to Islam because in Islam there is no such division based on caste. So they don't want to face any discrimination like they are facing uh, in Hinduism. So naturally they found Islam as a very good option and they were converting to Islam, only the lower caste. And many of the people they got converted into Islam because of the jizya tax. So what is this jizya tax? It was a religious tax for non-Muslims. So in those days, the Delhi Sultans used to impose a non-Muslim tax. That means anybody who is not a Muslim, they should pay certain tax. And if they want to visit their pilgrim centers or religious places, also they have to pay such tax. So to avoid that tax, many got converted into Islam. And it was only levied on non-Muslims. So, Jijia tax was collected on non-Muslims, especially Hindus. So, to escape the tax burden, many Hindus of lower caste or other caste, they got converted into uh, Islam. In those days, child among the Hinduism, child marriages, Sati and Parda system. So, Parda system is, uh, especially ladies, they have to cover their entire face. Like, you know, they have to mask their entire face. They should not show up the face. That was the religious tradition they had, which, uh, you know, which was prevalent in those days. And child marriages, you know, and sati means if uh, husband dies, uh, and, you know, the wife who is living should also forcibly go and commit the, uh, death along with husband. I mean, along with husband's uh, body, the wife who is alive should also go and bury herself. 
that was a you know olden days of blind beliefs which were being followed society under delhi sultanate was divided into four major groups one is aristocracy aristocracy means they are the ruling class people priests means they are the religious people who always gives uh, guidance to uh, the sultans and town people that means the common people who are living like traders merchants other people and the peasantry means uh, the farmers the laborers and all they were considered under peasantry this is this was how this was a major division of people in delhi sultanate so let us see who, which people are included in aristocratic class we studied that society was also divided on classes so aristocratic class See, this aristocratic class is categorized into two okay for delhi Sul sultans there is one kind of aristocracy and under delhi sultanate there were many hindu kingdoms there were many hindu kings so they had dif they are also aristocrats there was uh, you know islamic aristocrats as well as hindu aristocrats so it comprised the ruling class that means they are the rulers okay they are the kings so included the sultan the princes the governors of the provinces so many people were included under this aristocratic class sultan as the supreme head and princess means they are the sons of uh, the sultan and the governors are heads of the provinces that means states the sultan then the princess and the governors this was related to islamic aristocracy that means even though the sultan is head of all india in islamic and see suppose islam is there and they are the rulers of indian subcontinent now sultan is the aristocratic class person and under sultan there will be princes that means his sons and all and also the governors governor means just now we have studied iktidars shikdars and all so they are all also part of aristocracy class so these are all islamic aristocracy and i told you under delhi sultanate there are many kingdoms controlled by hindus hindu kings so these hindu kings they also enjoyed the position of aristocracy they enjoyed the privileged position in the society that means privileged position means a very luxurious and a very high position in society they are also included hindu rajas as that was a saying under delhi sultanate there were many kingdoms and each kingdom was headed by a hindu king even though these hindu kings of course these hindu kings are loyal to sultan but they are also the ruling class for their particular uh, kingdom right so they are also included under this aristocratic class hindu rajas and their princes that means their sons they were the wealthiest and a powerful class of the society so they were uh, the controllers of all the finances of the uh, kingdoms and they were the wealthiest and rich people and most powerful people of the society and priestly class who are this priestly class people they comprised the ulemas who were the chief advisors to sultans so ulemas are the religious scholars who were always uh, guiding the sultan and these uh, ulemas they were in, occupying a very important position as priestly class priestly class means like we call in uh, hindus and all pujaris and all in islam they are called uh, ulemas and maulavis they are also uh, there is other group of religious experts called maulavis they are experts in islamic law so islam proposes their own law okay the religious sacred text they have their own laws okay how people should behave how women should be there see this parda system and you know islam has certain kind of rules and regulations they should not worship uh, a god with idol and all those are all islamic laws so there were some people who were you know looking after uh, to implement this islamic laws they were called maulavis they are also under priestly class ulema sir they are people who are masters or scholars in the sacred texts 
so they used to guide the sultan in various aspects for religion maulavis islamic law is in getting implemented or not they will look after and qazis the islamic judicial officers so if anybody violates islamic law then this qazis are the people who are involved in punishments and giving judgments and all and the hindu brahmins if you take hindu society then the brahmins occupy the priestly class that means they do the all kind of rituals and other things to god and they use they also used to serve the hindu kings whenever they need so you know that uh, the kings also depend on these brahmins for performing yagnas uh, many such things so if you take hindu society hindu brahmins occupy the priestly class and if you take islamic society ulemas and maulavis occupy the priestly class this class people they held a highly respected position in the society and enjoyed a rich and prosperous life so they were also having a very good life in society after aristocratic class so the town people who are these town people the common people living in apart from this uh, ruling class and priestly class there were some common people living in those days the town who were these common people there were some government officers there were merchants artisans artisans means like uh, people who are very much skilled in uh, you know uh, you know making objects craft persons slaves domestic servants domestic means from household works and all will be done right so all such servants they are all together called as town people they were uh, other group of classes in society the ruling class will be there priestly class will be there and then comes the in next level the common people like merchants peasants sorry not peasants merchants officers under government the slaves and all they were considered in the, the next level and the other class was peasant class peasants constituted the lowest rung of the social classes in delhi sultanate unfortunately peasants or the farmers they were considered our farm laborers they were considered as the lowest people in delhi sultanate they were ranked as the lowest category of people even though they are the cultivators and uh, they were the farm laborers they were not given high status in society they used to have a very low status in the delhi sultanate their life was full of hardships means very much uh, difficulties struggles and poverty because they are the people who pay majority of taxes the tax collected from this class was the main source of revenue in sultanate of course these merchants and no craft persons and artisans also they make uh, they pay taxes but they doesn't include a major section the population is very less here if you take farmers these are the, this was the profession taken by majority of people if you take uh, society in those days almost 60% was uh, farmers and all people so they were facing lot of difficulties with the farm because these delhi sultans they uh, they were mostly collecting more more taxes from these people and it is tax that collected from this people was serving as major revenue for delhi sultans the treasury of delhi sultans was majorly filled by the taxes collected from this peasants so this was the lowest class of people in delhi sultanate so coming to the art and architecture so art means you can call the paintings and other such things and architecture means their construction style how was uh, paintings and all were there and how was the construction of buildings in those days the fusion of native indian and islamic cultures was visible in the music dance painting and architecture of the society so the indian uh, kind of art and architecture and islamic art and architecture they got fused right when these rulers started ruling from india as i mean as kings then there was a fusion in music okay islamic music and indian music got fused and dance dance forms were also 
there was a mixture i'll tell you what were the examples for that painting also there was a new kind of painting emerged indo islamic paint indo islamic dance indo islamic music indo islamic architecture so like this there was also fusion in art and architecture many sultans were great patrons of art and architecture the delhi sultans they have also encouraged this kind of fusion in both indo islamic cultures so in art and architecture also they have encouraged this kind of fusion and music and dance let us see first how they got fused the rule or the reign of delhi sultanate brought with it the introduction of several musical instruments in india such as tabla rabab and sarangi this tabla you know right now they'll have a two and uh, threads will be there on this and uh, two instruments so the, like this round objects will be there and you know with two hands this uh, they'll, this will be played and rabab so rabab is also you know it's like veena okay so it will be also but the edges will be different different way so strings will be like this so this rabab was uh, afghanistan instrument which they used to play sarangi okay it's also similar to veena but the edge will be little knob kind of thing so there will be a strings here and they used to play the instruments so tabla sorry tabla this rabab and sarangi were the musical instruments which were present in those days and amir kusro credited with the invention of sitar by fusing together the indian veena and persian tanpura so if you take indian veena we have uh, a round shaped object like this and we have a handle like this with strings so persian tanpura also in a way it will be little round and it will be like this so he mixed up both these instruments that means he took the models from both instruments and he created a new instrument called sitar so amir khusro was a great poet and also he was an architect of those days so he did not architect in the sense like this kind of musical instruments and all so he invented musician also he was a musician so persian tanpura and indian veena he took the models and he created another new instrument called uh, sitar so sitar also looks like this it differs with the strings the pattern of strings so little bit so, something like this would come and the strings would join to that handle so that was one other thing and he was also regarded as father of khawali khawali means like these people they sit on their uh, knees uh, they and you know they sing songs they clap their hands they get up they dance so that kind of uh, system of praying god was called khawali a form of chorus singing chorus means people will sing in group from persia okay in persia this was the practice like you know they uh, they sit they sit and with their knees and they clap they sing in group and they play instrument parallelly so in praise of god and all such things that was called khawali singing it was famous in persia so now you see indian music is getting fused in terms of instruments as well as in terms of singing okay which became very popular during the era of delhi sultanate it was used by the sufi sect to sing devotional songs who are these sufis sufis are a group of islamic people who believe that uh, they can reach god or allah through devotional songs and other means of music so these sufi people they are like saints okay so these sufi people they generally used to sing this uh, songs chorus singing khawali songs devotional songs during their religious meetings and the sultans used to encourage they conduct this uh, khawalis and they also have a kind of recreation and also they used to enjoy a lot through this khawalis and who used to do this the sufis used to do this alauddin khilji you take uh, many rulers of delhi sultans encouraged such uh, musicians alauddin khilji you take he encouraged musicians such as gopal naik and amir khusro and also balban you take he encouraged uh, in his court many dancers and musicians 
Feroz Shah Tughlaq also was a great pattern of music. So like this, the Delhi Sultans also encouraged this art and music forms, uh, dance forms in their kingdoms. So the musical text or the musical book called Rag Darpan. Okay, this was a, a most ancient uh, text on this dance forms. So this was translated into Persian during this rule. So during the rule of Feroz Shah Tughlaq, you know, there was a religious book called, sorry, not, there was a book called Rag Darpan where the music and other details were uh, written on, written in it. And Kathak, it, see, this Rag Darpan was written means that different ragas in music and all such things were uh, written in a book. That was the encouragement given in those days. And Kathak, a dance form that combines Hindu themes. Okay. You take, uh, she is a Kathak dancer. She will, when she dances, she will explain about a theme based on a particular theme or incident. Suppose, for example, you take Ramayana. They wanted to explain Ramayana. They explain through this a dance form with expressions and all. If you look at this Kathak dance, the dressing style looks like a Persian uh, uh, dressing style. Okay, this kind of dress wearing by this lady, uh, it, it belongs to Persian style. And the dance presented is Indian style. So Hindu mythologies or something they will present. So it's a fusion in dance. The dressing pattern was followed by Persian's pattern. And the dance form is representing a theme related to India. So here Indo-Persian fusion of dance is observed. So also emerged during this period in North India. So Kathak was also a major dance form during the Delhi Sultanate period. So there was some introduction about here Abul Hassan, uh, Amul Hassan Yaminuddin Khusru. So that is Amir Khusru. Uh, there is a introduction about him here. Like he was an Indian, uh, he was a he was called Parrot of India because of his contribution to music and uh, other areas. He was a disciple of Sufi saint Nizamuddin Aliya and became the court poet during the rule of Jalaluddin Khilji. And when Alauddin Khilji, Alauddin Khilji ascended, he wrote great Khazan ul Furut, which means treasures of it. So this, uh, this is just a brief description of uh, Mir Khusro, his contributions, and during whose court he was present, and what, what are the books he wrote. And um, he also recorded the campaigns of Alauddin Khilji. So all such details, he was a great, he was encouraged by those days uh, by Delhi Sultans. So if you look at the painting, painting did not hold much interest in the court of the Delhi Sultanate until the rule of the Lodis. So till the Lodis started ruling Delhi Sultanate, there was not much uh, encouragement given to paintings by Delhi Sultans. You take the slave dynasty, the Tughlaqs or the Khiljis, they were not much interested in paintings. But during Lodi dynasty, uh, there was a much uh, encouragement given to paintings. Persian miniature paintings influenced the Rajput miniature paintings. What is miniature painting? Miniature means very small and very detailed painting. So for example, you can look in this picture miniature paintings. It, it is very small, but every detail you can see it very clearly here. All details, you suppose even the designs on the dress of this woman. Is all, so of course this picture is not clear, but in general, if you look at the miniature paintings, the colors and every detail and the designs will be clearly visible. So Persian miniature art influenced Rajput miniature painting and they got mixed up and they were encouraged by kings. These paintings were used in illustrative manuscripts such as Shahnama or the books of kings and the Nizam, uh, I mean Nizamat Namat. So, Niyamat Namat. So, where this kind of paintings were used? These paintings were used in manuscripts. Manuscripts means they are the books. And in these books, there will be information recorded about kings. And during such things, suppose if they wanted to show the picture of the king, they make a miniature painting. So, coming to the architecture, the style of building constructions, palaces, forts, whatever you take, they're all part of constructions. So how was the architecture in those days? The Delhi Sultans introduced Arabic, 
Persian styles of architecture. In those days, the Islamic architecture was uh, a kind, there was different styles in Islamic architecture. One was Arabic style, another was Persian style and there was another, so these two styles were introduced, I mean style means the way of construction. So these two styles were introduced to India and these two styles blended it with the beautiful Hindu architectural style to produce a distinctive Indo-Islamic style. In India, there was one kind of architecture, construction of buildings or construction of, uh, uh, you take uh, temples and all. And Persia and Arabic world, there was one kind of architecture. This Persian Arabic blended with Indian style. So, both got mixed up and a new style of constructions emerged. What is it called? Indo-Islamic style of architecture. Let us see what was that style. So, the Sultanate period saw the creation of some beautiful architectural specimens. So, during Delhi Sultanate time, many constructions have been done and those constructions left a very good example to understand this architecture. Many of these specimens were built in and around Delhi, even though the geographical boundaries of Delhi kept shifting with each succeeding dynasty. So, if this is Delhi, so what happened? The Delhi Sultans, they constructed many forts, they constructed many, you know, buildings and other things in and around Delhi. And what happened? Each dynasty, so when every dynasty changed, the borders of Delhi also changed. It was, they were expanding Delhi, right? So in this manner, in and around Delhi, this kind of architectural specimens were available. Specimens means that they're, they're like an examples. Suppose here one construction is there, here another construction is there, here another construction. So like this, they went on uh, constructing different things. So here, the buildings of this period had some distinctive features. The buildings constructed during, uh, around the Delhi, they had a very unique characters. If you look at that building, they'll uh, altogether give a very different look. How? Extensive use of arches, domes and minarets. What do you mean by arch? Arch, you know, like, you know, you can see even like Hindu temples, they'll have an arch. So like this in front of temple, they'll have an arch, right? So this was a, a kind of arch they made and domes. Domes means a cubical, I mean, a semi-spherical structure like this. You can see on masjids and all. This kind of domes will exist and also minarets. Minarets, if you take char minar and all, so you can see that four uh, top minars will be there, right? So, like this. So, the, if you like, uh, like this char minar, okay. So, this kind of pillar, so you take Taj Mahal also in front of it, there will be, minar. of course, Taj Mahal was constructed during Mughals, but that's a kind of Persian style or Islamic style construction of minarets and domes and arches. So, these were the kinds of uh, things which were introduced in India. Earlier to this, there were no domes, there were no minars and all these things in Indian style. Once they came from Persian and Afghan, they got mixed up with Indian style and people also, there was a Indo-Islamic style of architecture. And the construction of the domes eliminated the need for construction of pillars to support the roof. Suppose you take this is the dome and now this will be the pillar and this will be the construction. Pillars won't be there now. So to support this dome, they construction a platform like this. So this becomes the construction. Earlier suppose, again otherwise if this the dome is not there, if to support a structure, they need to construct pillars. Right. So these pillars were uh, not necessary now. So, this kind of new architecture emerged. You take Taj Mahal. Do you see any pillars for uh, the dome shaped Taj Mahal? No. You can see only this platform and on this will be a dome. So, to support this dome, we need this platform. And inside this platform, the original construction will be there. So, otherwise, to support this dome and to support this construction, again, they need pillars. So, the construction of dome removed the pillar system in architecture. So that was a new kind of architecture that emerged. 
since islam prohibited the depiction of human figures see islam never goes for human figures because they don't believe in god in a particular form and idolatry and all they don't have so they don't have any kind of figures on uh, their uh, their buildings if you take hindu architecture we have many statues we have many kind of figurines you know uh, uh, women figurines gods figurines shapes and all such things they never practice in islam because they don't believe in such thing islam prohibits such kind of a particular form for the worship of god or human figurines geometrical and floral designs so this kind of uh, see so what happens uh, as they are not uh, i mean they are not depicting any kind of figurines or any kind of uh, human structures on uh, their buildings they go for designs what kind of designs geometrical and floral designs so they they make a lot of flower designs if you look at taj mahal on that now there are a lot of floral designs okay like this they make some floral designs but they will be very much in geometrical in nature that means they'll take a measurement and particularly they'll be uh, making that designs and they used to use this figure uh, designs for decoration of the buildings some indian motifs like lotus bell and wheel were also used in islamic buildings so lotus was also uh, made as a painting bell and wheel they were also used on these islamic buildings verses from quran were engraved in ornamental style of writing popularly known as calligraphy so on these buildings and all walls they make the quran's uh, sightings or the verses of quran the sentences of quran were engraved that means they were engraved means like Uh, using stone and hammer no sorry hammer and nail they used to make that verses of quran that means the alphabets and the arabic language no they used to make it as a on the walls of this buildings and it was called calligraphy you know that writing practice and all so some important uh, monuments of the sultanate period were khwatul islam mosque qutub minar alai darwaza tomb of giyasuddin tughlaq and the kotla fort kotla fort rajasthan and the tughlaqabad fort so these are some examples in and around delhi that will reveal the architectural or the construction of building style during delhi sultanate you can see here in this picture the recite the verses of quran okay the, whatever they said in quran they have engraved it on the walls okay you can see here nicely the quranic calligraphy of qutub minar so on qutub minar this kind of calligraphy the sightings of quran were written like this and this forts masks they serve as a best examples to understand the indo islamic architecture and cultural changes culturally in terms of language or you take in terms of uh, the religion what changes happened in those days there are in terms of dressing there were several cultural changes under the rule of sultanate that influenced the traditional lifestyle of india there was a native style in india in those days and persian and islamic style also got mixed up with the culture that means language and the dress and it also gave a new style hindus and muslims like started dressing in pyjama kurtas this you know pyjamas and kurtas you know and kaftans kaftans means like a, a long gown kind of things so which will be generally worn by the sultans okay so they wear like a long gown so that was called kaftans and this kind of new dressing patterns emerged uh, during the indo islamic uh, rule or the indo islamic cultural exchange process so in their dressing style you say salwar kameez so which uh, generally women wear and the biryani so this is all the dressing styles here salwar kameez kurtas and you know, kaftans they all got mixed there the new kinds of dressing patterns emerged uh, when this indo islamic cultural exchange happened and biryani bread and wine they became the essential part of indian cuisine see till then indians never had this kind of biryanis bread and wine they were brought from this uh, islamic and persian style and they they became part of our indian food also nowadays 
the yunani system of medicine the persian arabic traditional medicine was introduced to indians by the sultanate so even these yunani and other medicinal styles were so in terms of medicine the yunani style you now where they consider that uh, the elements of earth are very important in treating the diseases so they mix up certain kind of medications and you know, they create a new medicine and this kind of medicine was introduced in india and even yunani practitioners were also there in india if you take they are recognized as certified doctors in india so we we'll, we take different medicines right ayurveda and now like this this also a their arabic style of medicine and the in, this influence was two way from one side indian style was influencing arabic and persian style and the arabic and persian style was getting influence from indian style you take many areas this was happening from both ways the indian pan okay betel leaf and use of spices gained enormous popularity among muslims so muslims till then they were never using this pan and other things they got so much attracted with the pan and the betel leaf and other things from india and also they gained uh, spices also they liked it so much and uh, that was the food they liked and we like their biryani their bread and other things they also started using the indian turban so even the Indi- muslims they started covering the head with a cloth called turban cloth so this kind of systems were uh, learned from both cultures one culture was learning from other and it was like mutual learning process it witnessed in the religious ceremonies especially in marriage rituals which reflected a definitive indian influence you take indian islamic uh, people today they are, they keep flowers and other things indian indian muslim women they keep flowers in their head so whereas in arabic world they don't practice that so this is only a mixture of culture here so this kind of blend happened from both sides indians adapted certain islamic practices or arabic practices and the islamic world adapted certain indian practices and it created an indo islamic culture in india okay so this is about the lesson and